So hi everyone, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, today's talk for me is going to be a little different from what you guys have probably been watching. Um, surprise, surprise, I'm 16 years old. I'm from Orlando, Florida, and I flew all the way up here for my talk today. And um, your talk earlier was like really inspiring, so like hopefully this was as well as yours did. Um, so just to get started, um, today's talk is going to be me kind of presenting some research that I've been doing for the past uh, nine to ten months. Um, it's something that I've been researching and I've also created a prototype and so hopefully I can learn a lot from you guys as well as you guys learning from this. So a little bit of background of me, as I said, I'm 16 years old, I'm from Orlando, I'm in 11th grade at a high school called Haggerty High School. Um, my interest in cybersecurity started when I was 11 years old. Um, it started when I was watching my dad and I started wondering, what is this guy doing on his laptop all day? There's no way that he's that busy. And then I really started to learn about cybersecurity, which is exactly what my dad does. And it was just so interesting to me how there's so many different things that I've never really taken into account when it comes to the digital world, and that's where my interest started. And so at the age of 12, I did my first science fair project, and it was super cool. It was comparing Alexa versus Google Home, because I thought that was so cool for AI. Um, and that was my first science fair project, and it took me absolutely nowhere. I got third place, um, but I did actually receive some recognition from the United States Navy, because the one thing that was really driving me forward was my passion, and that was super motivational for me, and so I moved on to continue doing science fair up until now, when I'm currently in 11th grade. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that I've learned along this journey is that you should never give up because the first year that I even made it to states in person was this year and I've been doing science fair for almost six years now and I'm also going to be going to the international fair and that just went straight from doing absolutely nothing to going to the highest honor that science fair holds so that's a big lesson that I've learned. Oh. Thank you. Um, so to kind of get started on some background of my project, um, hacking is something that I'm sure everyone here knows about. Um, the one of the, these are the three big ones that I feel like everyone's probably heard about. Uh, the first one was in May 2019 for First American Financial Corp. Um, due to a, just a simple web vulnerability, um, access to private information that was not password protected was leaked, and 885 million files were exposed, including mortgages, um, bank account numbers, wire transfer receipts, just things that are honestly really bad information to have in wrong hands. Um, similarly, in January of 2021, Microsoft, their email exchange servers were hacked. And similarly, in December 2023, the New York Real Estate Wealth Network was hacked and 1.5 billion records of their database and 1.16 terabytes of data were ex uh, exposed to an unknown source. So to this day, we do not know where that data went and who was actually really, really affected by it. And that's just the big scare that comes with hacking. And this kind of introduces my project, and I stumbled upon um, this tool called SEMGREP. Uh, SEMGREP is basically um, this tool created by a company also called SEMGREP. Um, it basically, it's a platform that has a large database of predefined coding rules, and these rules are in the form of a YAML file, and these YAML files are there for every single type of web vulnerability that exists for every single language out there, like down to like C++, Ruby, and for every single vulnerability. So you can even imagine how large this database is. And SEMGREP, it's this, it's a tool where you can put in your code and SEMGREP what it does is it analyzes your code as its input and then it matches supposed vulnerabilities that can be found in this code that's been inputted and it gives you an output which is a rule that the develop, like you, the developer, should follow to make your code better. And I mean, this is an absolutely amazing program and this could help developers in so many different ways. But I was like, what if we can make this even better? What if we can really build on what SEMGREP already has here to kind of create a novel work in progress? So basically, just to kind of give a little bit more background, I'm sure everyone here has heard of ChatGPT. And ChatGPT is just a very simple input-output function. You give it something and you get something. But the thing is, when you want to get something, you want to get the right answer and you want to get it fast. You don't want to be sitting there asking no again, no again, no again, because that's what I do and it's really irritating. But the thing is with ChatGPT, the more important part of it is actually the input. You actually want to give it an optimized input to, in order to get your optimized output. And that's where prompt engineering comes in. And one part of prompt engineering is called shop prompting, which is kind of what I really decided to research a lot. And shop prompting is basically when you give ChatGPT an input you want to make sure that you're giving it enough examples. So a zero-shot prompt is just saying, hey, do this. No context, no nothing, just bam, bam. 
one shot is like, okay, hey, do this, here's a little bit of context. Two shot is, hey, do this, here's some context, and here's an example. Three shot is two examples, four shot is three examples, and you just keep going and going, and you wanna give it as much context as possible to receive your optimized results. So now actually going into my actual project, I researched five of the most common web vulnerabilities, um, because I, as I mentioned earlier with the hacking, vulnerabilities are super, super common, and they are the reason why hacking happens. So these are the five that I decided to research. Um, the first one is broken authentication, and that is basically just compromised passwords, compromised user information, things like that. Um, denial of service is the stuff you see in the movies, where all of a sudden your computer starts flashing, and things start popping up, and you can't really do anything, and stuff's going on on the inside. Um, there's cross-site scripting, which is basically just when the cybersecurity um, attacker is injecting like malicious scripts and stuff into your code. Eval injections, um, SQL injections are also similar. Um, an eval injection is putting something into your code that inside the eval function and SQL, similarly with SQL code. And so these are the five vulnerabilities that I decided to research. And I kind of started looking more in the chat GPT itself, and I wanted to see how I can um, use shot prompting, how I can use these different vulnerabilities to actually come up with something that builds on what SEMgrep has already created. So this is the chat GPT playground. And as you can see, it's kind of like, on the right side, you can kind of see it's chat GPT by itself. You have down there, you have what you input, and then it's giving you your output in the thread. But on the left side, you have kind of like, your customizable GPT. And this is something that I didn't even know existed. And basically you can name your bot, I named it Science Fair, I know it's original. And then on the instructions, you can actually put in what you want ChatGPT to focus on. And you can kind of see in the screenshot here, I put in some grep rules. And this was stupid, I hand copied in everything that I thought I could need, but then I could have just copied in the repository link and I found that out like three months in. But basically you get to kind of customize your GPT and then you get to choose what model, and for my model I use GPT-4. And you just kind of get to know more about what ChatGPT is actually capable of when you're actually feeding it info. Because machine learning is the whole thing about this. You don't want to already utilize what it has, you want it to learn more and you want it to become your best friend. So. After what, like, messing around with ChatGPT, I came up with this thing called a prompt dictionary. So as I mentioned earlier, you really want to have that optimized input to get your optimized output. So I kind of created a standardized little dictionary for my um, zero to three shot prompts, where I was going to put in like the same prompts over and over to kind of get ChatGPT learning, like certain keywords for it to learn to get better and better results as my trials went forth. So my zero shot prompt was generate a SEMgrep based rule that detects blank in this language. One shot was, okay, here's some code. So now it actually has some code to base itself off of, and then it will detect a vulnerability and give me the rest. Then with two shot and three shot, it was similar in the sense two shot was here's some code, and then I also gave it a, an example of fixed proper code. So now I have something to kind of compare, like here's the bad code, here's the good code, here's the rule in that instructions tab, let me see what I can do. And three shot was the exact same thing, but there's two examples. So moving on with the prompt dictionary and just everything in, cons um, in consideration, I came up with my little project workflow and how I was actually gonna carry out this experiment. So the first big step is I actually had to find this vulnerable code. How was I gonna find so much bad code to actually run an experiment off of? Well, that's where this WebGoat repository that I found online comes in. So WebGoat is just this huge GitHub repository of a bunch of different pieces of vulnerable code. And what I had to do is I had to fetch it, and I had to go through and I had to input that into my prompts when I was in those little red example places. And then I had to go through my prompt dictionary and I had to go through, okay, here's my zero shot experimentation, one shot, two shot, three shot. And then I actually had to make it detect the vulnerability with those, those prompts, record the vulnerability. But then when it's actually giving me my output, what am I getting? So obviously like with SEMgrep, I was gonna be matched with a rule. But here the novelty of this is that ChatGPT is doing what SEMgrep was doing, generating that novel SEMgrep based rule. But the cool thing is, is it was actually doing way more than what I asked it to. Because ChatGPT knows, it knows that as someone who's using it, it wants, it wants to give you what you asked for and more because it wants to be as useful as possible. So not only was I getting a YAML file with the rule base that I should follow as a developer, I was also getting an English summary. Because when you look at the YAML file, like I didn't understand what it meant. And I think one really cool thing was that the English paragraph that it would give is something that I didn't ask for and it would end up explaining to me as a baby developer almost that you need to really understand what the rule is saying. And then later on as I went forth with my trials, it actually ended up fixing the code for me. So yeah, it gave me the rule for me to learn. Yeah, it explained the rule. But then it also ended up debugging and fixing my code for me as I went forth. But I never ever asked for it and that's the beauty of the machine learning. 
So then once I get all my output, I had to filter through it because obviously as much as we can trust AI, we also can't. So you have to really fi filter it by syntax and what you're actually looking for to make sure that you're getting the best optimal results and then of course collecting my data. So when I got my GPT rules, my GPT output, I also had to compare it to what already exists with SEMGREP because SEMGREP is a company that's with so many like, <coughs> sorry, with so many people that have way more experience and knowledge about this subject that AI, I'm sure it does have, but SEMGREP has that human background to it. So I wanted to compare the SEMGREP rule to the GPT rule to really see if GPT was doing anything novel. So I came up with this little scoring matrix. Um, on the side, you can see the one, two, three, four, five. One and two were basically where, yeah, okay, GPT was able to do what I wanted it to do, but SEMGREP was just inherently better. Um, then for three, it was basically where SEMGREP's rule and the GPT rule were almost identical. For four, GPT was able to elevate the risk of what I was actually asking it to do. For example, like SEMGREP would say, okay, here's this vulnerability, here's a rule to it. GPT would find an extra rule, or it would find a little bit more of an importance to that rule that SEMGREP wasn't giving me. And then five is it did both. It elevated the importance and it elevated the number of vulnerabilities that it was able to find. So this is kind of a graph to kind of summarize what I found. So this is an average of all the trials that I did. So with the five vulnerabilities that I explained earlier, GPT um, with the three shot prompting and somewhat with a two shot, but mostly with the three shot, and that honestly made sense, it was the most um, defined prompt. Three shot prompting was able to come up with almost nearing the four and five range every single time except for denial of service. And it was able to come up, come up with more to feed me and more to actually work with in comparison to SEMGRAP. So, Yes, SEMGREP was able to come up with novel um, rules that are like hand filtered through by humans. ChatGPT was able to do so much more and give me so much more. So them coinciding and working together was giving me the most beautiful output that I could ask for as a developer. And so now moving on, I kind of wanted to elevate my results here. Like, okay, three shot prompting is getting me nice results. but. I kind of wanted to delve a little bit deeper, so I talked to one of my mentors and he introduced me to a CWE. So a CWE is just a classification of lots of different types of vulnerabilities. And so what we did is we wrote a short Python script to kind of make a list of all the CWEs out there. So for example, you can see the little defining numbers, like at the top, um, the very first one, CWE 787. That's some vulnerability, but there's 39,343 different instances of this vulnerability. So some grep, it was almost like a dictionary in the sense, like, okay, here's this rule, here's how it corresponds to this vulnerability. But in reality, there's almost 39,000 different instances of the same vulnerability in a different way. So what's really cool is that I had to take into account that not only am I trying to novel, um, generate a novel rule, this rule has to take into account how many different ways that this vulnerability could be found. Because the way I code isn't the way that you code. And that goes for every single developer out there. So what I did with these CWEs is kind of understood a little bit more and I actually decided to write a shell script to kind of connect all these things that I've learned together. So um, it'll be playing in the background. This is kind of how my script works. So step one is just I put in a code.js file um, and it did a syntax check just to make sure that syntactically everything is correct. Then it utilized a Python script to iterate through those CWE lists and then it actually calls the GPT function using an API key and ChatGPT is now comparing the CWEs that were already um, found by step two, comparing it and then running it through security rules, running it to, um, through to see wh when GPT finds the applicable CWE. It has to then AI, like AI generate this rule. So the rule is now generated, it's given to me in a YAML file, I get that little paragraph, then I go through it, it filters again, and then step five is honestly the coolest part where it actually goes through line by line and filters to me what went wrong, and then actually filter through and fix my code and debug this code. So this kind of summarizes here, step five is gonna load in a second, if it does. There we go, okay. So it actually filters through and you can see that I actually went through my code and then it ex at the bottom you can see the explanation and notes. So not only is it going through and fixing line by line my code and explaining why, it's actually doing basically the dirty work that I would have to do after. So it's not only is it teaching me, but it's also doing stuff for me. And as a developer, we're all lazy and so this is honestly a really nice blessing in disguise. And so, just to kind of discuss the implications of this, it's a very, very baby prototype. It's something that, like, I'm only 16. This is what I'm able to do with my scope with the help of my dad and two professors. But the implications of this is huge because SEMGREP, yeah, it takes 
a lot of effort to create the rules that it does create, but it takes so long. And AI is there, and AI is doing stuff for us. And if we can actually compare SEMGRAP's work to something generated um, by generative AI, it can actually help so much because you can have so many more rules. You can have more instances of these rules. And you can apply these rules in so many different ways. And then these, the implications of this is huge because hacking is something that happens everywhere. Sure, these big scale companies are getting hacked. Microsoft's getting hacked. The um, first American's getting hacked. But what about the people in like third world countries who have been working for 15 years to maybe get $25,000 to their name? And then that money is wiped instantly. And there's nothing that they can do because their small banks aren't able to protect their data the same way that these large Fortune 500 companies are to, like, able to. And so the implications of this project are huge because you can not only stop big scale hacks from happening that affect countries, but you can also help the, the little people, the people that aren't really actually thought of as much. And just to kind of finish off, I want to acknowledge um, my two mentors that really helped me and my dad, who's right there. Um, so my uh, Dr. Plant, he's a professor at Setson University, down from where, where I'm from. Um, Dr. Eckroth, who's also from Setson University, and my dad, who's also from Setson University. Um, just a lot of the, all the Zoom calls that happen at the most random times to kind of help me like learn what I've learned and help me get to where I've got to, um, and just like. Their excitement has really motivated me to come as far as I am because I'm 16, I'm a girl, and I'm in a very male-dominated industry. And it's just something that really helps motivate me to keep going. Um, so just a big thank you to them. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Um, any questions? Questions?